My name is Mark Smith. I'm president of the California Healthcare Foundation, and I will be um, your MC for today. Uh, I'm going to review briefly the program and then introduce um, all three of our panelists. Lisa Krieger is on the way and will be here shortly. Um, and I'll make a few remarks myself and make sure that we get done in time for questions and answers from those of you in the audience. And I also remind you that we have, I guess, we've now closed the phone lines. There are over 100 people who signed up to listen to this online or on the phones. And so when you do ask a question, please speak up and enunciate so that they can hear your question as well. Um, the order of March, we're going to talk about ending variation in end of life care in California. I'm going to make a few remarks and we'll, I'll then be followed by David Goodman, Steve Panelette, and Lisa Krieger. You have their full biographies in your packet, so I won't, I will dispense with the reading of the minutes in their entirety. Uh, take it from me, they're all highly qualified and very distinguished uh, and quite accomplished, but briefly, David Goodman is Professor of Pediatrics and of Health Policy at the Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. He's director of the Center for Health Policy Research and co-principal investigator of the Dartmouth Atlas of Healthcare, which is, I think, known to many of you as kind of the Bible of variation in healthcare. And while most of his work has dealt with health for, workforce supply and its relation to outcomes, he's done lots of work of unwarranted regional and provider variation uh, in many clinical areas and many patient populations. Uh, following him will be uh, Steve Pantelat. Dr. Pantelat is Professor of Clinical Medicine in the Department of Medicine at UC San Francisco, and he is the Alan, Alan M. Cates and John M. Bernard Endowed Chair in Palliative Care and the Founding Director of the UCSF Palliative Care Program. Dr. Pantelat's program, uh, the Palliative Care Leadership Center, has been training hospital teams around the state and really across the country on how to establish palliative care services. And his research focuses on improving care for seriously ill patients in hospitals. Lastly is Lisa Krieger, who is a science and medicine reporter for the San Jose Mercury News and the Bay Area News Group, covering news from Stanford University, the University of California, and other Bay Area research facilities. Her series, The Cost of Dying, a chronicle of her father's final days won first place for consumer feature articles in this year's Association of Healthcare Journalists Excellence Awards, and first place for multimedia storytelling in this year's Best of the West Journalism Contest. So we have, I think, an interesting and diverse panel of people to talk with you about this subject today. Let me begin um, with a few comments from the foundation. And as we looked at the title of this um, session, we thought, particularly looking over the slides of some of the panelists, that this wasn't about ending variation in end-of-life care. Not sure that's possible, even if it were desirable, but we'd already put out the title of the thing, so we couldn't change that. So through the magic of PowerPoint, we've added this word, because the focus really should be on ending unwarranted variation in end-of-life care in California. Our foundation, which works as a catalyst to fulfill the promise of better health care for all Californians, improving quality, increasing efficiency, and lowering the cost of care, has worked in end-of-life care for several years now. And I'd like to share with you, if I could, the results of our most recent survey, um, which uh, was published in a publication that's available to you called Final Chapter, Californians' Attitudes and Experiences with Death and Dying. I have to say that since the beginning of our work in this area, we have been prepared for kind of a huge backlash, um, which has characterized the political discussion of end-of-life care in Washington and in the Beltway, and I must say, it's never really come. Uh, one of the reasons we think it's never come is because we think there are some myths about how people feel about this subject, which I'd like to explore. The first is that if you look at where people told us they would like to die, 70% of people say they'd like to die at home, and yet only 32% of people actually do. And so there's a far greater proportion of people dying in the hospital, in nursing homes, often with or after an ICU stay, than actually is the preference of patients themselves. So one great myth, which I often frankly hear from my clinician colleagues is, we know these patterns of care don't really make sense, but our patients make us do it. 
Uh, and actually, the patients suggest they'd like a less aggressive, less intensive style of care in general. Second, um, we ask people what are the most important factors at the end of life, and somewhat surprisingly, because one hears that you can't talk about money, don't you dare talk about money, that's the third rail of politics. It turns out the number one thing that people say they're concerned about is making sure that their family is not burdened financially by their care. And when you, if you've read, read Lisa Krieger's uh, piece, and then when you hear her talk, you'll understand how eager, uh, anxious people are to talk about this issue. And so far from being an issue that you can't talk about because people don't want to think about it, it in fact is the number one thing people are concerned about. Also, perhaps surprisingly, somewhat down the list at 36 percent was living as long as possible. Um, so it's interesting, again, when you actually ask people what's important to them, they tell you things that are a little bit different from what one often hears in the political discourse about this issue. So let me just talk about a little bit of the progress that we think has been made. In one area, Physicians Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment, or POLST, is now widely recognized, legally enshrined, and increasingly used in California as a way of documenting the wishes of people so that the system doesn't click in. I'm an AIDS doc. Um, I know full well, and all of you who have clinical experience know that if someone's wishes are not documented, if it's not absolutely clear what they want, a, a nurse, a physician, an EMT, any provider arriving in the middle of the night not knowing the patient, not knowing the patient's background, not knowing the patient's wishes, the system clicks in. And once the system clicks in, it's very hard to unclick it. And so that's part of why POLST is so very important. Second, you're finding increasing media attention to this issue. Not only Lisa Krieger's piece, a very influential piece written by Steve Lopez in the LA Times last year about the death of his father, uh, the Conversation Project, a project which is beginning around the country to engage ordinary people in how do you have this conversation with your family, your friends, your loved ones, not in extremists, not in pain, not in a crisis, but at a time when you can think calmly and rationally about what you want and don't want. And we're seeing an increase in palliative care services in California hospitals. Some hospital systems are now at 100%. Kaiser Permanente, University of California Hospitals, and I'm pleased to say as of last year, every public hospital in the state of California now has a palliative care service with clinicians specially trained and tasked to deal with the issues of greatest importance to dying patients. So what's next? We think that there is strong interest by insurers in trying to align their benefits and their approach to these issues to the wishes that patients have increasingly expressed. There's strong interest in developing palliative care programs outside of hospitals because hospitals almost by definition are not well set up to pay attention to what are often the most important uh, desires of patients who are dying. And the Let's Get Healthy Task Force, which the Secretary convened last year, is working on a series of principles and recommendations that we hope can change the landscape in terms of how physicians, other clinicians, hospitals, and payers relate to this issue. I also commend to you, and it's in your packet, um, a better benefit, health plans try new approaches to end-of-life care. In this area, as in many other areas, the care that people get is often dictated or heavily influenced by the care that's covered, by what the insurance companies say is paid for and not paid for and where and under what circumstances. And we think there's increasing evidence that insurers are beginning to listen to the voice of patients and experienced clinicians in this area. Um, so to repeat, 70% of Californians want to die at home, but only 32% do. 36% of Californians rated living as long as possible as extremely important to them, fairly far down the list of other concerns. And 67% of Californians say it's extremely important that their family not be burdened financially by their care. I want to close with this. You may remember the phrase death panel. It became kind of infamous during the early days of the discussion of the Affordable Care Act 
and it was used to apply to a provision that was originally proposed that physicians would be explicitly compensated to have a conversation with their patients about how, when, where they wanted to die. That provision was kind of demonized as death panel and has been red hot ever since. In our latest survey, we asked people this question. One idea is to have insurance plans cover a doctor's time to talk with patients about treatment options towards the end of life. Do you think this is a good idea or a bad idea? And you'll see that over 80% of Californians thought it was a good idea, including a vast uh, majority of Republicans and independents. And so once again, it's been our experience that when you talk about the nuts and bolts, the reality of these agonizing decisions with people, it doesn't break down along the kinds of political lines that we've come to expect. It's an issue that increasingly is important to everyone, uh, and among our panelists today are people who can talk about the variations in the way this, uh, this uh, issue is treated, in the kind of training and program development that can improve care to, uh, for people at the end of life, and then one very moving experience for someone who's a skilled and experienced storyteller that really captures what this means for ordinary people. And so with that, I will uh, get off the stage and ask David Goodman to give his remarks. Very good. You'll bear with me for two minutes to tell you a story about my mother, who is uh, 89, uh, has advanced Parkinson's, uh, a disease that I never quite imagined could have such uh, quite frankly, a dismal end. Uh, but she's in a very good place, a continuing care community, and uh, lived there independently with my father for a number of years. And then as the disease progressed, she moved into assisted living, and now she's in a skilled nursing facility. My mother has been very clear about her wishes at the end of life. She always was. She never viewed uh, life as something that went on forever. Um, she was always pretty happy with her life and felt fulfilled by it. Uh, and uh, so she's expressed her wishes verbally and in writing and in legal documents that uh, are the documents of, of where she lives in Vermont. And yet, surprised to learn that despite this, the care facility um, sort of revealed that if she were to have a sudden demise in the facility, what they would do is call EMT, who would administer a full CPR, and send her off to the emergency room. And I'm trying to figure out what more could my mother or her family do to make sure that she has a sort of end of life that she, that she wants. So these days, I think, even with the best intentions, best facilities, we really have a long ways to go. I have a, a, an appointment over phone to talk to our primary care physician to hope we can clarify this. I think it really only her entering hospice care formally under the Medicare benefit that finally there would be clarity about that you know CPR would not be uh, the right thing at this point. So that's at the very micro level, but at the Dartmouth Atlas, we uh, examine and try to understand the full landscape of health care, and end of life care has been particularly important um, because what it teaches us about an important population, and it also teaches us some things about healthcare in general. The Dartmouth Atlas is a 20-year uh, project uh, that provides national reporting of health system performance and the variation in health system performance, variation in utilization, in costs, in quality, and in patient experience. And very much what we're talking about today is really variation in patient experience. The Dartmouth highlights variation, it reports it publicly, it's, the data is free. It also does research into the causes of variation, the consequences, uh, in order to provide compelling data to create change. California Healthcare Foundation has been a long-standing funder of our work, we're appreciative for that, uh, and has been particularly important in our end-of-life work. We at the Dartmouth Atlas are particularly interested in unwarranted variation. So we would expect that there would be variation in health care. I mean, populations differ from place to place. They differ in their health care needs, and they differ in their preferences. 
But unwarranted variation is a variation that can't be explained by differences in patient needs or in their preferences. It is really a type of variation that it measures the difference in how healthcare systems are behaving, how they're behaving in terms of the quality of care that they're delivering and the efficiency of care. Um, for this uh, particular study that we collaborated with the, the California Healthcare Foundation, we focused on Medicare beneficiaries. These are fee-for-service Medicare patients. We know relatively little about Medicare beneficiaries who are in Medicare Advantage. Their utilization to date doesn't have to be uh, reported um, uh, in any detailed way. But this is fee-for-service Medicare patients over 65 years of age who have died but also have had one of nine chronic conditions. Cancer, dementia, diabetes, congestive heart failure. And then we've particularly focused on their experiences and their patterns of care during the last uh, six months of life. Uh, interested in the utilization of hospital services and ICU services and also uh, this uh, very interesting metric in terms of the percentage of patients seeing 10 or more different physicians in the last six months of life, um, which uh, tends to be associated with very high intensity of care, lower quality, and we're concerned that it's really a metric that shows how disordered care can become in this particular period. We know that one of the barriers to delivering the care that patients want is good communication, and it's inevitable that the more care transitions, the more clinicians, the more physicians who are involved in the care, the more opportunity there is not for communication, but often for miscommunication, which is a, a really a serious problem. What is the right rate in these measures? Well, we're not sure what the right rate is. We know what is not the right rate. So let me suggest, for example, that having zero patients die in the hospital is not the right rate. So there are patients who want to die in the hospital. There are patients who have to, for a variety of reasons, are going to need to have their last days or last hours in the hospital. We know that's not what patients generally want, so we know that 100% of patients dying in the hospital is not the right rate either. We also know that the right rate is going to be different for different populations because there are these differences. And the important thing is not that there be no variation, but that each individual patient receives the care that they value, that have the experience um, near the end of life that they would like to have. And in that, rates may stay the same, but different people may be receiving different types of care. So when we look at variation, variation is often a clue to where there may be problems, but understanding what problems there are really needs to work with um, clinicians, doctors, and physicians to improve that care. We don't, do know that most patients don't want um, to spend their last days at, uh, in the hospital. They would like to be at home. They don't want painful or uncomfortable treatments that offer little hope of a longer life. That is a life that's meaningful to them, usually interpreted by a, a life, some semblance of the life they once knew. Okay. And this is sort of a difference between the perspective of a patient. When a doctor offers life prolonging treatment, patients interpret this as prolonging a life they once knew. And we as physicians know that often it may be no semblance of the life they once knew. Patients want to have meaningful lives. They want to live long and they want to live well. Um, they want to be as close to home as possible with family, with friends, and, and indeed with pets um, who are their friends. Um, very important um, to elderly patients. So um, what do we know um, from this work? Well, first thing we know is that uh, California, although it's made great strides and, uh, in providing palliative care and the experience of patients, it still lags the nation. So just in a very simple metric of the percentage of beneficiaries who died in the hospital at 29 percent compared to a U.S. average of 25 percent, um, and that the highest rates uh, uh, are in Los Angeles uh, and in uh, the San Francisco uh, healthcare market, the variation is really quite striking um, and is not explained by typical issues, for example, of urban versus rural. For us, San Diego actually has 
a rather low pr proportion of patients who die in the hospital, a very urban place, uh, and yet uh, Los Angeles, the, the rate is, uh, is quite high. Um, with being in the hospital is a chance that you're going to spend your last days in an intensive care unit. Uh, and in fact, California, again, tends to have a high number of days in the last six months of life. These patients uh, spend in uh, intensive care units compared to the U.S. average. And the places where patients are spending more days in the hospital, L.A., San Francisco, as an example, are also the places where they're more likely to be in intensive care units as well. Uh, and then there are some uh, markets that have uh, distinctive patterns of rather low hospital and ICU use. Now, this information I'm presenting today, <coughs> maps are nice, so maps, we can show this variation, but we have data and have worked with the California Healthcare Foundation, provide data at an individual hospital level. And within these markets and these broad averages is a lot of variation in the way individual hospitals perform. And it's worthwhile to go in, into that data and look at those individual hospitals. They have their own sort of fingerprint of, of care. Um, the number of hospice days has increased nationally and has increased in California, uh, although California still uh, lags. And generally, <clears throat> but not always, the places that have lower use of hospital service at the end of life tend to have higher use of hospice care. It's not a simple substitution, but there is that generality. And I mentioned San Diego before as having kind of a low profile with hospital use, and indeed it has a, a rather higher use of, of, of hospice services. Doesn't mean that hospice service, and hospice services is what we can measure for a much broader, and uh, my colleagues will talk about this more, a concept of care, of, of palliative care uh, that, uh, that uh, should in many situations really begin uh, quite early in the, in the course of a chronic illness to provide a comfort and quality of life. The problems that we confront, first and foremost, is the issue of communication, the problems with com communication. Um, Discussions with patients, inviting them into the decision making uh, is so important. And the problem, one of the problems is that physicians, we think we're doing it right now often. So physicians talk to patients all the time. All right. But they, from our training, we often have no clue of sort of the dimensions of communication and the shape of it that needs to occur so that information is fairly passed back and forth and patients are able to participate as full partners in the clarification of their wishes, their values, and expressing what they would like to see happen, what they would like to see done. Communication is terrifically important. From communication comes tangible expressions of preferences. Advanced care directives or physician orders for life-sustaining treatment. These can be very, very specific. They are very specific in my mother's case, as, as an example. We know, at least from past studies, that even the most tangible and specific directives are sometimes ignored. So this is the next problem, is the acceptance of these wishes and the implementation of them. Um, uh, all of this uh, leads to underuse of hospice and palliative care, and there may be patients who on the other side are getting palliative care or hospice care when, although it might not be what I would like or I would agree with, would really want more aggressive care. The miscommunication can occur in both directions. We know on average care is heavily biased towards more aggressive care. Physicians are good at diagnosing disease, but we're terrible at diagnosing patient preferences. We think we can diagnose patient preferences and from that make recommendations, but studies have shown that we're not very good at it at all. Communication, here's an example of a communication issue. If we look at the regions that the hospitals sit in and the level of proficiency of English in these regions, 
The regions with l generally lower proficiency of English, patients are more likely to die in the hospital, less likely to receive hospice services. And higher proficiency in English, less likely to die in the hospital, more likely to receive hospice services. This can be measured directly as well. A metric of physician communicates well. And what you find is that when physicians are communicating well, patients are less likely to, d to die in the hospital and more likely uh, to receive hospice care. Now sometimes this phenomenon, uh, relating it to sort of uh, English proficiency, has been interpreted that there are very dramatic differences in what racial and ethnic groups prefer on average for their care, that there are these strong cultural differences and that that explains the variation that we see in some of the maps that I've shown. I'm sure that there are, uh, that we know that there are some cultural differences, but they have been way um, overstated. The systematic studies that have been done looking at preferences, this is a, a study that uh, Dartmouth field, fielded through an NIH uh, grant. Uh, it's a national study, showed that while there are some slight differences, um, the interest in dying in a home-like environment was very strong across all groups, <coughs> across all groups. Um, so I think that some of these differences in the patterns that we see in the way the patient's cared for uh, is, uh, is, comes back to the communication issue. So what we know is that uh, quality is uneven across different places. This is also related to an emphasis on subspecialty care um, in patients with chronic illness. And behind this is an assumption that more care and more costly care is generally better and is generally the care that patients want. Um, behind this are care decisions that are dominated by the values of well-meaning, well-intentioned, but misdirected healthcare professionals, not the values of patients. And indeed, our payment system tends to reinforce this by the fact that certain types of care, not palliative care, not sitting down and talking to patients, but procedurally oriented care tends to be highly reimbursed. So organizations get strong signals about um, about where value lies. Improving care is listening to what patients want and including palliative care early. Palliative care is not a substitute for curative care. It is a partner of any type of care. It is a type of care that leads to, that's, in, that's directed towards comfort, towards higher quality of life, but also fundamentally better communication so that those channels of communication and particularly of clarifying values begin early in the chronic disease process that is then permissive of different types of care when a patient gets sicker and when prognosis is, is not as good. Decisions about palliative care or hospice care should not be made in a moment of crisis. These are concepts that need to be brought into the corpus of care. To do this, we need to invest wisely. If we build more ICU beds, they'll be used. They'll be used for good, but they'll also be used for patients who don't want or need that care. Palliative care is underinvested in um, California, although it's, it, great progress has been made. We know that most palliative care services are operating on, with tiny budgets, and that those services are generally restricted to inpatient care, consultative care, often sort of one-off care. And this is a type of uh, care that needs to be really sort of um, longitudinal and uh, um, working uh, uh, with the patient and the other clinicians over time. Now, the Let's Get Healthy California initiative is going to be tracking palliative care services and some of these metrics longitudinally. And that will certainly be very important in terms of guiding the change that will occur. So this sort of measurement, as we've learned nationally with the Dartmouth Atlas, and is also occurring in some states, is terrifically important for guiding and, um, and creating the tension needed for uh, this sort of necessary change. So it's good to see that that monitor is going to occur. And we can all hope that more and more will be paying, uh, not for volume of services, but for quality and outcomes. Uh, and with that, uh, um, you know, quality and outcomes and end of life care, when we achieve that, we'll have much different looking maps than we have today. Thank you.
Well, America is a land of choices. Uh, we have hundreds of breakfast cereals, we have dozens of car models, and there are countless places to get all kinds of coffees and cafes to enjoy them in. Um, and yet when it comes to health care, and particularly care at the end of life, it can be very difficult to understand what our choices are and what kind of options exist. And if we don't know what the options are, it's very hard to make a rational choice and to understand what our preferences sh could be or should be if we don't know what the options are. We are bombarded with advertising about cars and cereals and coffee, but get very little information, particularly about care, that we might get at the end of life which makes it particularly challenging for us to get the kind of care we want because we would rarely get the kind of care that you don't know exists and that you don't know you want. So let's imagine for a moment, I want everyone to just imagine the end of your life. Think about it for a minute. Where are you? Who are you with? What does it look like? Okay. How many people had this image in mind uh, when you're imagining it? This ICU? No one? All right. Uh, one, thank you. So one person. Because <laughs> of your age. Well, there you go. Fair enough. All right. OK, there, fair enough. Fair enough. And we'll talk about that in a minute, why people legitimately end up here. Um, so, so one out of about, I don't know, 75 people. Uh, but we know that one out of four Californians uh, who receive Medicare will die in an ICU or in a hospital stay that includes an ICU. And yet it's not what most people want for themselves or for their loved ones. Why does that happen? Well, for some people it happens legitimately. We become acutely ill. We end up in a hospital, in an intensive care unit, hoping that we will be saved. And despite the best efforts of the medical system, we are not. And then we're too sick to leave the ICU. That's very legitimate. But that does not account for the 25% number. Very often you see this coming a mile away and you know that this patient is going to get sick and you know that when they get acutely sick, they are gonna end up in an ICU with a very low probability of getting out or like David's mom, never wanna be there in the first place but are in a setting where they may not respect her wishes and she may end up here against her wishes, too sick to leave. And so the challenge for us is how do we think about this and how do we create a system that's going to be different uh, for our patients. And rather than creating more suffering for our patients, create a system that actually relieves the suffering. And here I want to quote Eric Cassell, who wrote about this particular issue um, back in 1982, around the uh, nature of suffering and the goals of medicine, when he wrote, the relief of suffering and the cure of disease must be seen as twin obligations of a medical profession that is truly dedicated to the care of the sick. Failure to understand the nature of suffering can result in medical intervention that, though technically adequate, not only fails to relieve suffering, but becomes a source of suffering itself. And so often we see, particularly at the end of life, that the medical care that patients are receiving add to their suffering, make them sicker, keep them from the things they really want to do and have happen, rather than support those things. So, we're talking about variation, and uh, if I've learned one thing in medicine, it's that variation seems to be the only constant uh, in healthcare. There is tremendous variation. And as, as has been pointed out, we're not trying to avoid or get rid of variation, but we want variation to be based on those issues that really should be driving variation, which is patient preference and not the availability of ICU beds or the culture in which uh, the physicians and nurses practice. And the challenge, of course, is that the variation is, in fact, not based on patient preferences because patient preferences go largely unknown. But patient preferences should and could be known, and if known, should be driving the reasonable variation in care. So what we, we heard from, from David Goodman about that these conversations are not happening but should be happening. What do we know about when these conversations do happen? I want to share with you just one study that asked that question, and they surveyed 332 patients with advanced cancer at four cancer centers across the country. And they asked the patients this question. Have you and your doctor discussed any particular wishes you have about the care you would want to receive if you were dying? It turned out only 37% of patients reported having this conversation. This is of a sick population with advanced cancer. 
What was interesting is those patients who reported having this discussion were not depressed, sad, or worried. So talking about these issues did not upset patients. And interestingly, there were no patient characteristics that predicted having a discussion. So we might imagine, oh, it was the sicker patients, it was the ones with the worst cancer, it was the older patients, it wasn't any of that. In fact, there was only one factor that influenced whether patients had this discussion or not. Can you imagine what that is? Yeah, the relationship with the physician, but it turned out that it was even broader than that. It had to do with what center you received your care. So in one center, 65% of patients reported having this discussion, and in another center, it was only 13%. So what does that tell us? It tells us it's not about the patients, but it's about the culture of care that we create and where we practice. Now, if, you, if patients had these conversations, these discussions, they were associated with a better quality of life near death, fewer invasive interventions, including less likely to end up in the ICU at the end of life, and better outcomes for caregivers, not just for patients, but for their loved ones who were less likely to have complicated grief and depression six months after their loved one died, if their loved one had this conversation with a physician. A really dramatic outcome to imagine that a medical, a conversation could not only improve the care of a patient, but improve the care of their loved one as well. What this really tells us is about the power of culture. If we didn't already believe it, it tells us about the power of culture. And that is the culture rules. But we have to remember that we are the culture. We, doctors, nurses, social workers, chaplains, patients, and their families, we are the culture. And because we are the culture, we can change the culture. One center, 65% of patients had that conversation because that became the norm of practice. And in one center, it's 13% because that's not the norm of practice. If we ask Californians in a California Healthcare Foundation study that was referred to earlier by, by Mark Smith, uh, awareness of end-of-life terms, we find that most people have actually heard of hospice care. So they actually know what that is. But as we go down the list, advanced directive, a minority of people know what that is. And only 17% of Californians said that they knew what palliative care is. Now, that's not surprising to me. When I talk with patients, they don't often know what palliative care is. But once they know what it is, they're often very happy to receive it and are pleased with what it provides. So um, let's talk about that for a moment. And the, and the problem is that patients don't know what to ask for or what is possible. You can't ask for palliative care if you don't know what it is or that it's available or what it can do for you. And part of our challenge is that we don't know what it is. If we think about the way people are born in this society, a generation ago we were born in operating rooms generally. Women were largely anesthetized. It was a very medical procedure. And if we look at the way people are born today, it's very different. We have birthing suites at UCSF that we show off to people. They have jacuzzi tubs and music. And well, I don't know who would sit in a jacuzzi at that time. But nonetheless, it's a very different experience. People know what to choose from. This is how hospitals sell their services. It was not doctors and nurses who made that change happen. It was the public who made that change happen saying this is not an acceptable way for people to be born. And the public has an important role to play in changing the way we face the end of life as well. But first, people have to know what is possible. So what is palliative care? I want to share with you this definition developed by the Center to Advance Palliative Care based on public research, market research, about what, me what matters to patients and what's meaningful. Palliative care is specialized medical care for people with serious illness. This type of care is focused on providing patients with relief from the symptoms, pain, and stress of a serious illness, whatever the diagnosis. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. Palliative care is provided by a team of doctors, nurses, and other specialists who work with the patient's other doctors to provide an extra layer of support. Palliative care is appropriate at any age and at any stage in a serious illness and can be provided together with curative treatment. Now, that is a mouthful for a definition, I agree. And what I often say at the best bedside is, our goal is to help you have the best possible quality of life for as long as possible. That's our goal. It's for people with serious illness, not for people who are dying. Whether that illness is cancer or heart failure or emphysema or liver disease, 
or dementia, serious illness, to relieve symptoms, pain, and stress. We all know if we've anyone who's been sick or had a loved one in the hospital, that's a seriously stressful time. And we want to relieve that stress. And the goal is to improve quality of life. Abraham Lincoln said, it's not the years in your life, but the life in your years that matters. And whether we measure that life in years or months or weeks or sometimes days, the question is, how do we help people have the best possible quality of life? Finally, provides an extra layer of support. It's not instead of any treatment that you might receive, but in addition to the care you might receive. And it looks like this, uh, which is to say that at time zero, if you're diagnosed with a serious illness, cancer, for example, the focus should appropriately be on cure. Can we cure this illness? There's a lot we can do to control and cure cancer. But there are questions that people have even on the day of diagnosis. I've had many experiences when I give someone this bad news of a diagnosis of cancer. Their first question is not, what are you going to do about it? But their first question is, am I going to die? How long do I have? That's what first comes to mind with that diagnosis. That's a palliative care question. That's a question about the end of my life. That's a, that's a delicate conversation. The conversation often then will go to, what are we going to do about this? And this shows that there are times where there's more curative care, times when there's more palliative care, and that as the disease progresses, either because we no longer have treatments to cure a disease or because patients no longer want them, the focus of care may be more on palliation and less on cure. But the curative care is appropriate even at the very end of life. And controlling a disease, for example, heart failure and medications for heart failure are actually very important even on the day of death, potentially. And it shows that hospice is an important service for people who are nearing the end of life. The way we design hospice in the United States, the benefit means that people get it in the last six months of life. And generally, it means that they get it for much shorter than that. We'll talk about that briefly in a moment. And just to point out that bereavement is very important and that the healthcare system needs to pay more attention to bereavement and how we help people through that delicate time. Doing this provides the best care possible. The best that we can do is to combine the best of modern curative intent treatment with the best that we can offer in palliative care. And if we provide this care, what, what outcomes happen? Well, everything good happens to patients who receive palliative care alongside their curative intent treatment. They report a better quality of life. They have improved symptoms. They have less pain, less shortness of breath. They have less depression. They're less likely to receive aggressive care at the end of life end up in an ICU. They live longer if they receive palliative care. I just want to say that again. They live longer if they receive palliative care alongside curative treatment. And people often say, well, I, there's a trade-off here. Do I want quality or quantity? And that is a false choice in healthcare. It is possible to have both quality and quantity. And palliative care helps to support that. They have higher satisfaction with their care. There are better outcomes for loved ones, as I showed you earlier, and there are cost savings. When people get to choose, they often choose care that is, in fact, less expensive. They don't want to be in an ICU, which is the most expensive place to receive care in the United States. They'd rather receive care at home, many of them. And so the discussions we're having have to be about living, not dying. People don't really want to talk about dying. That's not my experience. My experience is that people want to know, talk about living and how to live well. We have to ask about preferences, values, and goals. When you look to the future, what do you hope for? When you think about what lies ahead, what worries you the most? Understanding what's important to patients. Patients and their loved ones can ask more questions about what else is available. OK, that sounds OK, surgery. OK, what else? Okay, there's ICU care. What else is there? What else is available? And keep asking those questions to really get at what is the broad range of services available. And then once we have these conversations, we have to share them. We have to share them with our loved ones. We have to share them with our providers. And we have to have them written and available. I've seen post forms completed and put in the safe deposit box because they were so important. <laughs> And then when they really are needed, they are nowhere to be seen. And I've also seen them taped to the refrigerator and taped to the inside of the door, which is really where they belong. Lots of copies in lots of places to make them available when you need them. 
providers don't know what to offer and they don't know how to talk about it. And let me just share with you a little bit of data here. Uh, there is, uh, if you look at older physicians, 60 and older, um, very few have had any exposure to palliative care. Very few. Um, only 6% in medical school, 22% in residency. And yet, if you look at younger physicians, less than 39, uh, it's really quite flipped. Most have had that exposure. This makes me very optimistic about the future. As we have more palliative care services in hospitals, particularly teaching hospitals, as we have more curriculum, we know that we're training doctors and nurses and social workers and chaplains about palliative care. And so there is hope that things will change over time. And these physicians here on the right, these 60-year-olds, they will still benefit from the palliative care that's now being offered, even if they don't provide it themselves. Uh, and we need more tools in the toolkit. We don't all know how to have these conversations. Like this physician says, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. Um, and that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. The problem is not having the conversation and not sending to someone who can. It's important discussions that we need to have, and yet, and they are nuanced, and they can be difficult to master. And yet there, are, there, there is evidence that we can teach doctors and nurses how to do this better. We can, uh, we can arm them with tools for their toolkit. We say if, if, if the only tool that a construction worker had was a hammer, it would be very hard to do their job. Hammers are great for certain things, but if you have a bolt that's stuck, a hammer is not a very good tool. And so often what we find is healthcare providers have really great tools and they're very skilled at using them. They just have a limited number of them. And we have to try and expand the tools in the toolkit. And part of the tools are the communication tools. Um, so you'll hear if you walk around a hospital, you'll hear someone say, would you like us to do everything possible? To which the answer is, yes, <laughs> of course. I, I've never heard you know, someone saying, would you like us to do everything possible for your mom? And someone say, well, for my mom, half. How about that? I've never, heard, I've never heard that happen. I don't think that I will. And the problem, of course, is that this is a bad question. We shouldn't ask this question. We never ask a question for which there is only one answer, and it's not the answer you want. Better question, how are you hoping we could help? <coughs> to which the answer might be, she's short of breath. I'm in pain. I need more help at home. I'm tired of coming to the hospital. Asking the right question can help you drive at the right, get to the right answer. And part of our education of healthcare professionals is to teach them how to ask these questions and for patients to know how to answer these questions and to think about them in advance. And finally, services are lacking. So hospitals, fewer, than, fewer uh, than half offer palliative care. That needs to change. Outpatient palliative care services are rare. Only 8% of hospitals offer them. Hospice is available in every community in California, but enrollment is limited by the six-month prognosis and need to give up disease-focused care, which people are reluctant to do and increasingly shouldn't be asked to do because they're not toxic. And they help you live longer and better. They're, at, in fact, palliative. So why would you want to give it up? Home-based palliative care is rare, and yet so many people can't leave home but need care there. And there are not enough palliative care certified physicians, 327 in California, fewer than one per hospital, not enough for the demand. We want to build a safety net for palliative care in all settings. And so a few recommendations to leave you with. One, in California, we should mandate palliative care services in hospitals. We can do that as a condition of participation in Medi-Cal. If the carrot doesn't work, the stick often can. Expand the hospice benefit for concurrent care. Patients should not be asked to give up curative intent treatment in order to get hospice services. There are experiments in the commercial setting that demonstrate that when these services are available without the restrictions of giving up certain care and without the six-month prognosis that patients enroll in hospice more, they use more hospice services, and overall it saves the system money. So we can improve quality and lower cost. Integrate palliative care into bundled services for people with serious illness, such as dementia, heart failure, and cancer. Should be part of the service that, that patients are eligible for. Require outpatient home and nursing home palliative care services in all benefit plans. We, again, we have the power to change this and to make this happen. 
We need to support the training of palliative care physicians and nurses. There aren't enough. So many hospitals and other systems want to expand their palliative care services, and what we hear is there's no one to come and run the thing. We don't have enough clinicians to do this. This is not an expensive way to increase the workforce, but a necessary thing to do if we're going to have the services available. And finally, to embark on a public information campaign about palliative care. I think Mark Smith did a wonderful job of showing us that people actually want to talk about these things. This is not a taboo subject, and we need to start doing this in public and having this conversation. It's easy sometimes to think about end-of-life care and the variations and think about the bad stories and think that it's just about suffering um, and there's no way to make it better. But I always like to finish on, a, on an optimistic note and quote Helen Keller, who wrote that although the world is full of suffering, it is also full of the overcoming of it. And some of these changes and recommendations that we can do and the way we can work together to change the healthcare system can make this better and help relieve suffering for our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve and Mark and David. Uh, great summaries, as usual. My name's Lisa Krieger. I write it for the San Jose Mercury News, cover medicine and science. And my message today is a little more personal. Um, but it relates very profoundly with what's being discussed today. How we die matters. You know, it, it matters to us, of course. It really matters to those who survive us, our families and our kids. That's what they'll remember going forward for years and years and years. And a lot of that depends on where we die, how we die, where we die. And that's what's so germane about today's um, findings. There are studies that show that deaths in the ICU are seven times more stressful in, in the lives and the memories of the survivors than deaths um, in hospice care or in, or in palliative care. Um, it's very traumatic. You miss the chance to say goodbye. You miss the chance to say, I love you. You mattered. You know, I'll remember you always. So today I'm going to really try and do, do two, three things. One is um, a personal story about my experience that is very relevant to today's findings. Um, a little bit about what I learned and a little bit about how we took that experience at the Mercury News and Berrien News Group and made it into a journalism project that's really helped jumpstart the conversation. And I'm profoundly uh, grateful for the support I got from the California Healthcare Foundation. And we used some preliminary findings that are very similar to what's being presented today. That's me. Here's my dad. I was an only child. Um, my dad started about, my dad's story ended about two years ago um, down at probably the best, one of the better teaching hospitals in California, state of the art, very advanced care, kind of the place you'd think you'd want to be. It started um, back in 1923. He was a, a child of the Depression, um, son of a judge. They made enough money to send him off to college. But then World War II broke out. So at age uh, 19, he was sent to engineering school and then to the Manhattan Project at Columbia University, um, sent down to Oak Ridge. Very successful engineer later in life, got an MBA. Um, very, very smart man. He c tutored me long distance through calculus and, and chemistry. Uh, we skied together, played tennis. I was an only child and very much a daddy's girl. He was with my daughter and my mom, who we had lost previously. But by age 88, I brought him out to live with me. There really wasn't much left. You know, he's very pronounced dementia. He couldn't figure out where my mom had gone, was always asking for her, was profoundly depressed. Uh, back pain, other problems, very, very frail, very, very frail. And then suddenly, very catastrophically, on a beautiful day like today, um, he got pro profoundly sick. Very small infection turned to a large infection. Um, necrotizing fasciitis is probably a story that may be similar to experiences you've had with loved ones in your life. And you do what you know to do, right? You want to save them. So you rush them into the ER, which is what, where, you, where there's help, you think. 
The ER is very much a conveyor belt to the ICU. I did not know to ask the right questions. I thought I knew this stuff. You know, I'd covered medicine for 25 years. Um, palliative care was not offered as an option. Hospice was not offered as an option. This is day one and day two of his stay um, in the intensive care unit. Does anybody know what a day costs and costs Medicare and ICU unit? Just one day, what the what the bill is? I'll take a wild guess. Twenty-five thousand. Bingo. Also in this bill is a um, immunoglobulin for forty-eight thousand. His immune system was shot. Um, State-of-the-art antibiotics. Started at two thousand for some of these. Um, and the much larger cost of the suffering that he was going through and the suffering that I was going through, not realizing that there are other options. The hospital did what it's so good at, which is saving lives. You know, that's what, that's what we want them for. That's what they're good at. But it prolonged suffering, and again, I didn't realize there were any options at that point. This is day three and day four, day five and day six. By this point, they were suggesting surgery. They were suggesting amputation. They were suggesting skin grafts. They're suggesting uh, three to six months of skilled nursing. Um, this is a man who this is a man who couldn't remember his own name. You know, barely recognized me. Day seven and day eight. Um, final bill was for three hundred twenty-three thousand dollars for eight days of care. So what I wrote in part to gain clarity about what happened, in part to educate others that there are other options and that um, all of this needed, needs a really close look uh, was the question of just because it's possible to prolong a life, um, should we? And I use that as a um, jumping off point to use um, preliminary data out of Dartmouth um, to look at variations in life, life end of life care, and it was startling. I found that in the San Francisco Bay Area, you're twice as likely to end up in an ICU as you are in Portland or North Dakota. Even within one city, I, I chose San, San Jose because that's where we're based. Within 12 miles, there are hospitals who spent 23, th or billed Medicare, 23,000 per day more for essentially identical patients. Huge variation. This is a database, let me actually go back here. You can't really see it. Um, further down on this page, um, we did a really nice map of the United States and how end of life care varies. Um, there are such stories in all of this. For those of you who are journalists or, or public policy experts, each, each, all of this tells many stories. The um, variation in the, US, in the US, of course, variation within cities. Um, we did a searchable database you just see the top of it here where you can, uh, readers, subscribers could type in um, medical centers or hospitals that are in their area and look at what Medicare spending is, days in the ICU, days in hospice. This is just a screen uh, shot, um, but again, just a really rich source of information. Oh, here we go. Here's, here's the map of the U.S. Um, then I, I actually pulled out of the Bay Area hospitals and compared their um, hospice rates, which was startling. I had a whole lot of help by a physician in palliative care um, whose mom had fallen, hit her head. She was admitted to um, another teaching hospital, and he was describing how hard it was to fend off all the aggressive care. Um, because she had fallen, um, she wa they, they wanted lots of scans. She was put on catheters. and. Um, a lot of other intervention, and one problem led to another problem to another problem. He finally discharged, you know, insisted she be discharged, um, put her into hospice um, where she could have Korean food, uh, Korean translated Bible, and she did great. She recovered. She, was, she graduated from hospice. Um, and he's a huge proponent of um, fending off what really isn't necessary. So these are just stories that all came out of this. As I, as I mentioned, these findings and, and data, um, rich vein of personal stories that make this really compelling to readers because as Steve 
the point that Steve made, which is so right on, and that is um, it's all about changing culture, and we are changing culture, and we do that through storytelling. We did one on um, uh, advanced directives, choosing how you die. We did one um, about palliative care. This was actually Palliative Medical Foundation. Um, this gal's 52 years old, cirrhosis, advanced liver disease. She's getting care at her, in her trailer park. They're coming and caring for her. Um, really profound difference in the end of life. Did a piece about use of feeding tubes at the end of life with dementia, still shockingly common. Again, there's data you can uh, look at to tell that story. And uh, caregiving. Spent three months with a gal in hospice. This remains one of my more fun and rewarding experiences in journalism. She had a bucket list of what she wanted to do. The, the beach, the, um, the zoo, camping, and we documented it all on video. And um, really, it was so rewarding because she didn't survive to see how all this would, the difference it would make, um, but really generous soul. And then we concluded with um, a piece called A Better Way at the End, where we promote palliative care and the use of um, research and data like this. Um, we have copies of our special section in the back of the room, which I encourage you to, to get. And then created a website with, um, uh, where all the stories live now. Um, a lot of resources live. Um, a lot of referrals to California Healthcare Foundation, Coalition for Compassionate Care, which I really recommend really, really recommend California for Coalition for Compassionate Care. Tips for how to fill out the forms. Um, here's my contact information. If there are journalists out there who would like to know a little bit more about how we, we did, our, did our piece. Increasingly, it seems as though my, my story, my coverage, our experience um, is really just part of what seems to be a growing cultural change here and how, um, how we end our lives and how we end our lives in quality. And it's driven by days like today. You know, this is where it starts. Um, so I just really want to thank you all for being here. Happy to take questions. And um, thanks very much for your interest. So thank you to all of our speakers for being both um, informative and punctual. Uh, and we now have time for your comments or questions. And um, yes, sir. I go by Burns, and I've been around in Sacramento for about 35 years uh, as a lawyer and a lobbyist and consultant, <clears throat> mostly trying to build up home and community-based systems and supporting family caregivers and people with disabilities. So that's kind of my bias. My question is, I'm a little bothered, although Lisa does touch on it, and there's oblique references, but I'm bothered, in the, even in the context of talking about uh, hospice and palliative care, there's not more emphasis on family caregivers, mm -hmm. unpaid family caregivers, who make the difference. Mm -hmm. Part of my question, and we've seen some of these systems torn down by budget issues and the Schwarzenegger administration, that's all politics and history, but how do we, going forward, with the great incentives for hospitals to be able to make money to do more training and involvement of family caregivers? And Stephen has in his backyard one of the best programs in the state, Family Caregiver Alliance. I'm sure he knows about it, but I'm surprised there wasn't more emphasis uh, on that in his work. So my, is my question clear, particularly for the MDs and the more medical professional types, how do we support family caregivers in order to not only lower costs, but also provide better care and support them in the whole context of palliative care? Okay. Well, tough question for you, Steve, but so I know you can handle it. Steve, do you want to start? Uh, you family caregivers often do make the difference between someone being able to be at home and not. So they're incredibly important, and uh, we don't uh, recognize uh, how important that is. Uh, so there are things that physicians can do to help uh, caregivers and just asking how they're doing and um, checking in with them is actually very important, has actually been demonstrated to make a difference for family caregivers. So just some empathy and, and sort of checking in, um, recognizing what people can do. Uh, education for caregivers I think is really important and underemphasized. People often worry that they won't know what to do and they are nervous about what will happen and a lot of what we try to do is to educate people about how to be able to provide that care. And ultimately, uh, one of the challenges we face is that the healthcare system really isn't designed uh, to, to fully support caregivers and care at home. 
and, and there are rules about what kind of care you can get and how you can get care at home. And we find this a lot, that what people, the difference between being home and not is not having a nurse at home, but just having someone who can provide that care. And yet there's no way for the healthcare system to pay for that currently. And one hope I have is that if we think more broadly about health care and we think about bundling payments, that there could be a way to actually support more caregiving at home, either through family or other caregivers. Lisa or David, you want to make a comment there? I, I think there's so much misinformation out. I think a lot of people think Medicare pays for caregiving, and then they're finally confronted with it, and, and it doesn't. And I think they also think that hospice covers all of caregiving, which it doesn't. Um, again, I, there's some great organizations that offer caregiving tips, but boy, structurally, um, offering some sort of reimbursement. I mean, it's, it's cheaper to us as a society to keep folks at home, which is where they want to be. You know, I, I've actually heard from people who have written me that have said, I try, we tried to keep mom at home and we just couldn't handle it. So we sent her back to the hospital. And I think, again, yeah, uh, I think recognition of the tremendous cost and sacrifice. People sacrifice their careers. They sacrifice their, other op their own health. It's crazy. And it, but it, it's actually saving us as a society money by their, their, their sacrifice. So maybe some kind of reimbursement. I don't know. I'll leave that to people who are smarter than I am. No. I, I yeah. do think, as Steve said, in, in what is increasingly being a system in which some organization is capitated for care and gets around these little rules about who gets paid for what, mm -hmm. the reimbursement environment will improve. There's one other, I think, sign of hope, which is, in my experience, part of what is difficult is, as you say, Steve, people's level of training or confidence about their training. And if you think about some of the technology that's now available in terms of wearable sensors that can do monitoring of people's blood pressure and their blood sugar and their pulse oximeters and stuff that does not require trained professionals, I think with the right reimbursement environment, it will open up a whole new world of what's possible at home and hopefully people who can be more confident that if something really is going wrong, they don't have to be a trained nurse to recognize it because the technology can do so in an automated fashion. So uh, I, think, I, I think we hopefully are at a place where both the reimbursement and the technology are converging to make that kind of care both more accessible and more possible than it's been before. Yeah. Uh, thank you for putting this together. Um, I am a, uh, a hospitalist that actually turned into palliative medicine, board certified last year, and started a palliative care service at Mercy General Hospital starting October. I have my chaplain, my iron and social worker here, and we have an excellent team, and we started October of last year. Um, the biggest, I mean, I think I've, uh, change of culture is slow. There are certain departments that are going to be last to go, and we always talk about that, and we understand that. We have had um, very good feedback from nursing. We started nursing education. We can't be there all the time, but we can train most people a little bit, and that does a lot of help. But I think my biggest concern is, um, you know, that 8% outpatient palliative care uh, support is it really hurts us because even when they get us involved early, I kind of feel like I can't have the conversation. I understand. I want to protect the patient from the other specialists that even though they had this conversation, they're going to go to a cardiologist and get an AICD in. I mean, I want to protect them from the wishes and the goals that are sharing with me when I'm, I'm involved early. And I cannot because I don't have an outpatient palliative colleague to hand my little baton to. And beyond that, we have been trying to hire. It's not like we haven't been trying. I, I realize that palliative care physicians are very uh, few, but I mean, what is being done? I mean, uh, is there a way, we talked about reimbursement, death panel issue about outpatient doctors having this conversation and having it somehow be documented in our you know, computer system that anybody can open this wish list and say, these were the things they wanted, so maybe they don't want to be on dialysis. But how do we make our conversation that we had important enough and pertinent enough that carries them out in the early stages of their life so they don't end up in the ICU even though they had that conversation. What okay. are your strategies? Comments? I'm obviously not a palliative care physician, um, but I think a lot about health <clears throat> about healthcare systems. And your vignette um, is a very good one because, again, it's emblematic of the difficulties that we confront when care is fragmented. 
So, you know, this fragmentation of care and the lack of communication, the lack of cohesiveness of care, um, as you know, causes problems in end of life care and in general care, both in terms of the quality, what we'd all recognize as quality, but also in terms of, you know, unnecessary waste uh, and, and then, you know, a lack of, you know, waste of patients' lives uh, oftentimes. Building capacity is certainly one part of it. And you've spoken to the lack of capacity and, and you know, that um, can be slow um, to happen, but it's not sufficient. What um, drives many of these patterns of care that you're describing and the culture of care, um, quite frankly, are deeply embedded um, financial incentives that have led to the evolution of the system that we have today and tends to perpetuate it. Um, so Mark has referred to this, um, the, the hope that we all have, and it's really, you know, an experiment of how capitation or pseudo-capitation, pseudo-capitation under what's been referred to as accountable care organizations, um, might at least provide some assistance in this. So as there is accountability and responsibility, if you will, for a population, um, whether it be a, uh, uh, a multi-specialty group or a hospital, and that's a responsibility that's quite global. And so it doesn't end when they leave the hospital door. The, the interest of the organization extends to their entire care, um, and both in terms of quality and a very diverse set of quality metrics, but also because there's some shared savings that allows hospitals and medical specialty groups to reinvest towards the, you know, the care that, that we think is desirable. Um, it, but it will require some of these fundamental changes, I think, to rectify uh, some of these problems with fragmentation and with different providers sort of uh, acting with different interests is the way I would, is the kindest way that I, I think I can put it. What you're pointing out is really a, a chronic problem in, in the system. There are not enough trained providers. Uh, there will never be enough trained providers. Uh, and there aren't many uh, care systems outside of hospitals uh, and hospice currently to kind of fill that gap. Uh, we do need to train more doctors and nurses and social workers and child. I think there's no doubt about that. We, we only train 200 doctors in the country every year, but there's about a 10,000 doctor shortage if you look over the next 10 to 20 years. So we need to increase training for doctors and nurses. We need to pull our colleagues in to do a lot of this work. A lot of what we call primary palliative care, kind of the basics, uh, need to be done just in the way that uh, most high blood pressure is not managed by a cardiologist or a, or a kidney doctor. It's, it's managed by primary care physicians, family physicians, nurse practitioners. I think a lot of what we do as experts can be done by, um, by someone else. Uh, and so we have to bring our colleagues in to, to do some of this work, train them, support them to do it. And then as far as outpatient services are concerned, there are resources available. The California Healthcare Foundation has the palliative care action community, which is now looking at this, bringing groups of providers together to really think about how do you do outpatient palliative care? That road is not clear. It's not obvious how to do that. I, I think what David said is right, that there are, there are going to be reimbursement systems that will support that, but we have a problem today that we have to deal with today. Uh, and, and that's part of, part of that learning is going on now. The Center to Advance Palliative Care, CAPSI, has very good uh, online resources. Their iPal outpatient to really think about what are the issues and how to get it started. So I think in partnership with either the physician group, the insurer, the, the hospital, uh, to really work together and see this as a common concern for patients that's, that's a quality concern, and how do we work together to develop it as some practical things to do today. Hi, my name is Maureen Sullivan, and I'm an attorney, and a lot of what I do is uh, advanced care planning as well as wills and trusts and that sort of thing. And I also do a lot around elder abuse and people remaining in nursing homes too long. But the question I really have is about the conversation. And when do you know when to have the conversation with the patient or the patient's family about what to do? I have sometimes found family members ready to have that conversation with their parent, and there may not be full capacity there for the 
person who will ultimately affect to give their consent to whatever their family is trying to discuss with them. In addition, I also find that family members, children differ about what they think their parents should have. And how do you resolve those issues? When do you have the conversation and how do you have the conversation is essentially what I'm asking, particularly as patients are older and perhaps with dementia or lack of capacity. My dad's doctor, when, when my dad was given an Alzheimer's diagnosis, that would have been the day, I think. Um, I have since talked to people out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, which is really the, the does state of the art, uh, Gunderson Lutheran Health Center. And uh, my understanding is they start doing building an advanced directive planning mm -hmm. with the annual physical at age 50. And then, it, you know, it's a living document, right? So then they update it if there's a diagnosis of a a chronic or potentially problematic um, illness or disease, you can update it. You can keep having those conversations. And then, and I think they've reached something like 96% saturation in their entire community of people with advanced planning documents. And you look at their, their data at their end of life ICU care, um, it's just a fraction of what ours is. Um, I've, when I, I've talked to many, many community groups about this, a lot of senior centers, and my message to them is always, um, this isn't depressing. You know, this is a gift that you're giving to your loved ones because you love them so much. You're going to help them avoid stress. And you would like to help them do the right thing for you. And if you're, if, if it's awkward, um, you can say to mom or dad, help me out here. You know, let's, let's talk about this. Maybe you need to initiate the conversation. I've talked to folks in my 50s who've said, they get all their kids together. Um, maybe it's Thanksgiving, and it's, you know this is my turkey. It's my conversation <laughs> before, before we serve the pie. Um, and um, it's like you know, get over the drama, right? And then this gets to the issue, and I'm sure the experts here can elaborate more. But um, in terms of kids disagreeing, my understanding, and you, as an attorney, know this. You worry about the, you know, the white knight writing in at the last minute, um, who's been estranged from the family mm -hmm. for 30 years, has no idea all these unresolved issues. Mom always loved me best. Um, <laughs> but that's what the um, advanced planning documents address. And they're very simple. I mean, you could do them on the back of a cocktail napkin. And by designating one person, the point of having the family together when you talk about it is that everyone hears who that person is. And if there are any issues, you can talk about it then, right? Everyone's all there. You know, does anyone have any problems with this? Um, anyway, that's been yeah. my spiel. Thank you. My name is Douglas Samea Reed. And um, I have kind of a two-part question. but. I'll try to make it brief. If palliative care is to rise outside of the hospice setting, what do you think that's going to do to the hospice as an industry? And all of you in some fashion have promoted hospice in its current form when you know, or I would assume should know, that hospice is virtually unregulated in the state of California, that they've been doing this for 40 years, nearly 40 years, they have a track record of, uh, as of 2008, they are audited once every 11 years. They have no enforcement. Apps, they will admit at the CDPH licensing certification will admit they do not enforce anything. No patient complaints are ever enforced. They will not enforce federal CMS regulations, which the conditions of participation. They can, but they won't. They will tell you they can only do Title 22, which contains no patient protections or anything at all. And in their marketing practices, they denigrate hospitals and physicians particularly strongly by saying, oh, they're just going to hook you up to machines. They're going to crush your ribs and your chest. Is this they're part, is this part one of the question? This, you is, still? this is part two. Oh, OK. This is part two. OK. The first one is, is basically, what do you think the rise of palliative care outside of hospice will do to the hospice industry? Will it improve it, make it go away? And the second part is, why would you all promote hospice when it's not doing what it's supposed to do now routinely and has been allowed to kind of skate through? I mean, there are a lot of good stories, but you're not oh. hearing the bad. OK. Steve, you want any comments? Well, uh, you know, I, I hear the good and the bad, but I hear a lot more good than bad. So um, I do hear some, some stories that are, that are concerning, but I, I'll be honest, uh, I, I'm not an expert in regulating hospices, but uh, by and large, they provide good service to, the, to, to patients who need it and want to be at home. 
Um, whether there's more regulation that could or should happen, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't argue with that. But by and large, I would say that they, if you're someone who wants to be at home and get your care at home, hospice is a very good service for making that happen. Uh, I think that palliative care has the potential to um, expand what hospice does, because I think hospice is, uh, is available in every community in the state. Virtually every community in the country has a hospice available. And if you think about who are the providers of palliative care in the community, in the home today, where that expertise lies, it's with hospices. So my guess is that many hospices will actually um, come in and start to provide not what we today would call non-hospice palliative care, uh, but could be on a different kind of, we, we could also restructure the way hospice is organized um, to allow hospices to provide that kind of care. So my guess is that the rise of, you know, the growth and expansion of palliative care will lead to the to growth and expansion of what hospices uh, offer and the services they provide. So Lisa, you, you spent three months with someone in hospice. What's, I, your, what's your I impression? did, it was a nonprofit. Um, she actually had been a hospice nurse uh, and was a, um, a big believer in what it offered. I found it po very positive. I certainly have heard um, some horror stories as well. Um, her particular situation, she was able to live such a rich life to the very end. Um, and she was pretty clear dialysis, she was dying of kidney failure. Dialysis um, was not an alternative that she wanted. So I'm afraid we are out of time. Um, let me ask you first to please fill out the teal. Um, they are teal, right, Danny? The teal evaluation forms. It will help us do a better job with these sessions. Uh, I know at least a couple of our panelists can stick around if you have unexplored areas that you'd like to follow up on. And please join me in thanking our terrific panel on this evening. Thank you.